All right, you ready to roll, man? Yep, absolutely. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, and I figured since we're just going to kind of do a, a free flow discussion, I just hit record. So, um, yeah, welcome, uh, guys. Welcome, welcome to the uh, Vonnie Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the Servile Society. I'm your host, Shane, coming to you from the Free Republic of Pasnia, the Self Liberator's Paradise, uh, Pasnia.com. Uh, so, today I, I welcome back Max Hillebrand to the podcast. Uh, as our regular listeners should know, uh, Max is a Vanu and Van Nomad traveling across Europe, uh, living primarily off of Bitcoin. Uh, he's an avid contributor to the Wasabi Privacy Wallet, and, uh, well, well, much more, much more. Uh, but uh, I'll leave it there for now. Um, so, yeah, Max, welcome back to the Vani podcast, man. Uh, how, are, uh, how are things going overseas? Oh, yeah. Thank you very much, Beck, for the invite. I love being here. I, I just recently caught up with some of the few shows that I did not yet listen to of the Vanu podcast. And I was like, ah, I'm, I'm aching to speak here again. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy to be back. You, you know, actually, I, I think you had a, a really good uh, quote or tweet recently about the definition of the servile society. Um, I, I fail the exact words, uh, but maybe can you, can you re rephrase your mm -hmm. definition of servile society? Yeah, yep. Yeah, I'll yeah. I'll pull up. Uh, I will pull up um, that tweet. I got my Twitter open right now. Um, so what I said was, um, another definition of the servile society is one in which coercing others is not only normalized, but deemed foundational and necessary to survival itself. Uh, needless, needless to say, I want nothing to do with uh, such a society. Yeah, so good, man. Such great words. Really well put. Um, it's fascinating, right? And we see this kind of. Like in the in the last year, we see this so much that that the the um, the, the being servile, right, the, the bowing down to the rules of the masters, is the default, and that's how it has to be, and uh, it's expected. Uh, it's it's a weird thing. It's a very weird thing. The servile society. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. I guess. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I was kind of wasn't wasn't uh, planning on going there, but um, yeah, I guess um, I don't know. It was just just on my mind yesterday. I was I was think I was thinking about it, and uh, um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's really really it's really basic, man. Um, it's really really basic. Like um, uh, I mentioned this, and I think one of one of my conversations with a smuggler, like uh, you get you get down to um, you know the very foundation of things. It's wh whether you call it the golden rule, the non-aggression principle, or just you know like not coercing people. Um, like to put it very, very simply, um, like if people could just get that very, very basic thing, it doesn't have to be convoluted, it doesn't have to be complicated, just stop coercing each other. Like that's, it's really, really basic, right? Yeah, right. Actually, uh, it, it should be common sense. Unfortunately, it is not common, uh, which <laughs> kind of uh, is yeah. an oxymoron and it doesn't make much sense in the, in that word, but yeah, right. It's, it's something that obvious that. Uh, I, you know, in praxeology, they they put these assumptions, right, um, as self-evident truths. Right. Um, like, for example, humans act, right? Well, that's a true. You're like, you cannot say, oh, no, humans don't act because you saying that is an action, right? Mm -hmm. So you're you're um, contradicting yourself by just making that statement. And it's a self-evident truth, right? And as soon as you see that from that light, I mean, obviously, right? There's, it's, it's, it's just a trivial conclusion, but it mm -hmm. seems that nobody actually made that question right right and and uh and you'd think like uh there's um you know i guess get, getting to like concepts like natural law and i guess universalizable principles like any sentient human being or any sentient human would like they don't want to be coerced right like stolen from um raped um killed like um people don't want those things like people like cite these very rare examples of people who enjoy you know such su such things but those are you know very very rare exceptions and um you know there may uh, maybe other factors too but i mean it's it's really really basic like uh yeah it's really really basic i don't know um and uh it's 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 funny like i it's it's been it's been quite a quite a long path i know you've been you've been doing this for for at least a number of years as well um but uh it, it was um <laughs> You know, you you can uh, you can research a, a lot of things. You can learn about a lot of stuff, but it really is really do, it really is do, does just seem like it's it's that basic. And and Rayo was onto this, um, you know, back in the '60s. Um, he had it uh, he had it pinpointed. Um, coercion's the problem. Like that's that's the um, and maybe maybe he didn't see it in exactly that light. Maybe it was just a, a definition, maybe a, a varying definition. But um, yeah, he was on it for sure. Just another another example. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and he had a great vision to articulate well, pretty much entire school of thought on how to well increase freedom, or in other words, reduce the invulnerability to coercion. Right? That's uh, that's a very smart way of looking at it, and I think it got him 
quite far. I'm not sure if he maybe, you know, ran off in, in, in a rabbit hole and got a bit too crazy, <laughs> but at least it led him to very interesting conclusions and actually living those, uh, which, which is fascinating. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And um, it, brings, it brings to mind, um, uh, I guess, a conversation I had with Smuggler and Frank in the last episode and something you commented on on Twitter, um, a connection that you made that, um, that neither one of us three did in that last conversation. Um, but one of Rayo's concepts, uh, um, yeah, just refer back to that episode uh, on secure communicators, um, I guess, uh, a way to do uh, encrypted, you know, uh, encrypted trade. Um, essentially. So you, you made a connection between something modern that's around today um, that I've unfortunately not used yet, um, but uh, I'm familiar with it. Um, I've looked into it in the past, um, but the BISC network, um, you, you kind of mentioned that his, his communi secure communicators idea uh, might actually be uh, something uh, that's, that's uh, you know, here and, and they here and now. So do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, guys, if you want to hear the quote of Rayo's book, Sean uh, read it in, in the last episode. But yeah, it basically talks about this network of communicators or, well, computers, right? A so-called, nowadays we would call it a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized network, right? He basically talked about that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and where people can m make an offer uh, of a good or a service. Like, hey, I'm selling this thing. Who wants it, right? Um, and this offer is encrypted and relayed over a trust-based network. That's actually very similar how it works in BISC, right? Anyone can make an offer with, hey, I want to buy 50 euros worth of Bitcoin. Um, and uh, this is now propagated in the end-to-end -end encrypted network through Tor um, to different nodes in this network. There's like Rayo makes a big point here on the trust factor being very important and the reputation, like that you only talk to um that you only talk to peers whom you actually trust. Right. Um that's actually turns out to be very difficult. Um a smuggler made a great point on this in the conversation that this is just, you know, well, not easy to do to build this decentralized network of trust. Um specifically, you know, when you make an offer to only send it to trusted people. That's really tricky um, because, you know, since it's an anonymous network, well, there could be a malicious person hiding behind Tor and you would never find him, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that is, that is, I think, still not totally solved in BISC. Where they do have a reputation is when you see the, uh, the orders, like you see all the offers of, I want to buy Bitcoin, I want to sell Bitcoin. Uh, all of these trades are in a public offer book and they are tied to the reputation of a certain trader, right? So throughout multiple interactions, you can build a reputation uh, and become well, more reputable and more trusted uh, for, mm -hmm. for this exchange. Um, so it, th there is still some, some trust management involved here. Um, but ultimately, it's a platform where you can sell or buy anything for Bitcoin in a secure way, even with anonymous people. Um, just because of the way that the escrow system works and where fraud, where coercion is nearly impossible. There's like uh, almost none, like an insignificant small am uh, amount of, of theft that went on in the BISC network um, due to their genius way of using Bitcoin multi-signatures as a, as a collateral. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it is it is interesting too. Just to, just to think about um, uh, a project I was working on. It's it's defunct now, I guess you could say. We haven't haven't talked about it in a long time. Um, but uh, but but Darklands, um, it's um, <clears throat> it's it's really interesting. Just how easy or how how basic and how how um, you know how how useful just a basic like you know um, star uh, you know rating and review system is reputation system is on a website or on a, on a marketplace um, like it's uh, it, it's not foolproof obviously but um, you can be pretty you can be pretty pretty damn sure um, like uh, for example there was uh, um, Haven um, I uh, on uh, on uh, my smart my broken smartphone that's um, the last one I'll have at least uh, at least until I get uh, you know a more encrypted um, more more secure open source version. Um, there's a, a Havens on there. I think that's the um, the I guess the App Store version of uh, is it uh, Open Bazaar possibly? Um, I uh, I ordered uh, it's it was it was just a, it was like a fifteen dollar Bitcoin uh, fifteen twenty dollars maybe like six months ago and just Bitcoin. I just wanted to try it out and uh, it was this little this uh, this light speaker thing, light Bluetooth speaker, just for the hell of it to see if see if just to check it check it out and uh, yeah, just went with uh, you know the, the the one you know one of the stores with the the ratings good ratings and yeah it's that easy um it's uh it's it's, it's that easy um 
so yeah, I, I guess I'll, I'll just mention that as, a, as another possibility for folks. But um, yeah, it's always, it's always good to see these, uh, these, these decentralized um, open source platforms, especially ones that have been around for years. Like I, I've been doing, like we, we did the Crypto Anarchy series here on the Vani podcast. It, it started in like 2018. So like a lot of these projects are, st- are not only still around, but there's been so much positive progress. So that's always, always good to see. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Like the, the amount of progress that has been achieved over the last two years is like mind mind boggling. Um, there's there's so many different advancements, not just you know on a conceptual level. Like 2018, like Lightning Network was in its very infancy, um, and in the meantime, the protocol got so much more advanced and fine tuned, um, or you know even uh, other more you know fundamental pro- protocols uh, have been done or improved a lot, but especially on client side software, I see the the most as like exponential improvement. I mean, something like BISC, not to be honest, two years ago, it was, it was pretty unusable. <laughs> then they, uh, they did a complete user interface overhaul, right? So everything you look on now looks new and shiny and pretty. Mm-hmm. Um, but also again, on the architecture, like they, they moved to a much more efficient, uh, and private, uh, multi-signature scheme. Uh, under the hood that you as the user don't even notice, but that enables a lot of cool, cool use cases. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. And um, I guess speaking of uh, speaking of progress, I'm always particularly interested in the Bitcoin privacy realm. Um, and uh, that's yeah an area that, that you spend a lot of time in. Uh, f- f- fill us in on, on what's happening there. And I guess maybe this could tie into Lightning, at, not Lightning Network up- updates, too. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess l- let us let us know, uh, I guess, what's what's new. Uh, what's new from your end? Yeah, so um, again, on the protocol level, Taproot, uh, as I think we spoke once or twice on this podcast mm-hmm. already, has numerous privacy benefits. Uh, and nothing has much changed on the concept, but recently we've been uh, struggling to get it implemented and activated uh, as a software consensus rule change in the Bitcoin network. And that's just such a complex and difficult task. <laughs> um, the, like, you know, coordination amongst anarchist free software contributors is not easy <laughs> right and with so many different stakeholders involved um but i think we're making progress i'm i i actually see a rather good chance that we get taproot activated um uh, like within this year uh, and actually get usage at the end of the year of, of taproot already uh, like that's hopefully my best case um it could of course still be two years old uh, who knows but um yeah, and, so and real, real forward, quick, could you could so. you could you just just for just for in, in case uh, there's a new audience, could you, could you give like a, a minute or two overview of what what Taproot is and, and what it would uh, what it would do for Bitcoin? Yeah, so I think Taproot uh, is a great privacy tool because it re- it reveals less information about the economic transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, so what do I mean by this? Um, you know, one of the cool things with Bitcoin is multi signatures, meaning that. Uh, Instead of you only need one signature to spend the Bitcoin, you actually need, for example, two out of three signatures uh, from three different private keys uh, to make that transaction valid. Uh, And this is possible in Bitcoin since the very early days. Um, But it always had the downside that you have to reveal all the three public keys and the two signatures that you spent with. So everyone knew that you were using multisig. Right? And that's, well, the privacy leak. Uh, you might not want to share this information. Hmm. Uh, Taproot improves upon that uh, by us- utilizing a new signature scheme called Schnorr Signatures. Very simple math formula, very elegant, like extremely elegant. Um, and that can be used to do these so-called aggregated public keys and aggregated signatures. So what that means, if Shane and I want to do uh, a multi-sig together, um, Shane cre- creates his individual private key and um, his individual public key, and I have my individual private and public key pair, right? But now we both combine our public keys, we literally sum them up like one plus one equals two, and that gives us the aggregate public key. Um, And only this aggregate public key is revealed on the blockchain, right? So it looks like just a single signature public key, right? Nothing new here, just a regular single user transaction. But actually, without anyone knowing this, um, this is a public key that where two people need to sign uh, for that to be valid. Like we need two independent signatures that together turn into this aggregated signature. Um, 
but again, on the blockchain, we just see one aggregated public key and one aggregated signature, um, making it much more of a choice of, of what you actually want to reveal or no, as little as possible. Right, right. Yeah, uh, very, very good, uh, very good overview. Um, and uh, you said, uh, you know, progress, it's, it's, you know, things are going in, in a good direction at, uh, at getting that, getting that, uh, that change implemented, I guess. Uh, what's um, just, I guess, out of curiosity for, for myself, and I guess some listeners might be might be curious too. what's, I guess, what's the next step for that? And, and uh, I guess, uh, what's, uh, you know, yeah, what's, what's, I guess, what are kind of the next steps, uh, steps there? Mm hmm. Yeah, so the, the the difficult thing is when we upgrade the rules, is that what happens if we don't upgrade at the same time, right? Or maybe some users upgrade, some users don't, right? That gets really complex really quickly. Uh, and again, specifically in Bitcoin, because it's pure anarchy, right? You make your own rules, right? You verify your own rules and you enforce them. You're judge, jury, and executioner. Nobody can fuck with you, right? Beautiful <laughs> position to be in. <laughs> But it, it kind of annoying if you want to coordinate with others and everyone can just do what they want, right? So, um, as, and especially there's like, we, we don't, mm, or how do I say that? Like, if you don't upgrade uh, to Taproot, you can still use Bitcoin. Like you're not excluded uh, if you do not want to upgrade. You can continue using the old address types and the old signature versions um, without any problems. Even if Bitcoin act, uh, even if Taproot activates, right? and that's, so that's, that's, that's really fork. the that's really the only feasible way that it could be implemented, right? Is is via a soft fork, and that I think that's the right way to do it anyway. Just from 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 my own my own my own viewpoint. Yeah, philosophically for sure, right? Um, because if someone else says you must upgrade these rules, otherwise you're out of the network, uh, that's kind of a you know that's that's somewhat of a of a weird thing. Like, no, thank you, I want to make my own rules. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Get out of here, right? Sure. Um, but the nice thing is with Taproot, other people can use Taproot uh, uh, and run by these rules, but I don't necessarily have to, right? Um, and that's the big distinction between a hard fork. In a hard fork, everyone must upgrade. If you don't upgrade, you can no longer use the network at all, right? And that sucks. Um, so I would say any change of the rules is quite a critical and a very, very complex task. But at least change the rules in a way that you don't force everyone to upgrade if they don't want to for whatever mm -hmm. reason, right? Um, but but still, if you want to upgrade it, especially if multiple users want to upgrade, it is very important that their upgrade mechanism is coordinated, um, specifically that they start enforcing these new rules uh, at the same time, right? Because if some people say, "Oh no, this taproot transaction is not valid." But others say, oh, yes, this temporary transaction is valid. Well, then we have a chain split, right? Um, we come to different conclusions in different parts of the network. And that's exactly what Bitcoin tries to solve, right? To, to everyone reach the same point of truth. And if we no longer reach that consensus, uh, that's a critical failure, right? Uh, so we really have to be careful that this, that this upgrade that many, many people just want to use. Like, I don't hear any meaningful criticism against uh, Taproot. Many people come up with beautiful use cases. So many people want to have it. Now the trick is, how do these people who want to use Taproot coordinate so to not, uh, you know, fork off consensus? Mm -hmm. Right, right. And of course, I like my, my position is always privacy by default. I just know, like, I guess I don't know for sure, but it seems like it'd be very, very improbable. Um, like a hard fork would be like you would, you'd have to get like you'd have to get full consensus essentially, and that like I guess for like and it'd, it'd, it'd be it'd be more difficult. Um, and also too, like I I always just look back to my experience with Monero, um, and that like uh, um, they they had regular I don't know if they do anymore. I haven't haven't followed the project in a couple of years, but they had regular hard forks like every six months, and um, the very last I guess the last straw so to speak. Um, it took it took me like I, um, I yeah you had to upgrade the wallet and then the wallet synced to the wrong blockchain and uh, you could I couldn't get my money out it took like I so I I, had, I I tried on a couple different occasions it wasn't an easy process um, so what good is you know a so called private transaction if I can't even spend it so and that was and that that was you know I guess maybe the issue with with uh, with hard forks and it's understandable obviously um, definitely definitely understandable in project and uh, you know projects early on and such but um, but yeah uh, you're gonna lose people and. Um, yeah, you know, uh, I mean, yeah, certainly, certainly, one mm -hmm. people to eat, certainly would prefer people using Bitcoin over fiat. Yeah, 
I mean, just imagine you have a bunch of gold coins, right, that you have lying around somewhere in your basement. Maybe you got it inherited from grandma, right, and you're saving it for since forever, right? Now you want to spend it and you're like, oh, no, sorry, that's no longer valid. You should have upgraded to gold 2.0 like five years ago. Oops, sorry, right? Well, that just doesn't work. Um, yeah. If like if you cannot like saving is supposed to like you don't act <laughs> like you don't spend your money right you save it for a long time and it should reduce your risk and to reduce your uneasiness you should not need to worry about the money that you have saved right? right it's just there you have ten gold coins lying around mm -hmm. that will not change right they will not get magically more or magically less it's just ten gold coins period right but if you actually have to worry about it constantly upgrade it that introduces a lot of uncertainty and a lot of friction right. that frankly money is designed to solve uh, so i agree that these are some of the concerns that i see with monero as beautiful as the privacy technology is and i think that the ability to hard fork that often is crucial in developing such an advanced level because you just have to introduce breaking changes rather often to get to that point because well there's you know progress and, and innovation yeah. um, but it comes at this monetary expense right right yep yep Yep, and uh, obviously it's it's uh, it's uh, you know just for I guess for curiosity purposes it's it's all it's obviously great to see it to see both to see both projects and and uh, you know what's what's going on. But again, I haven't followed Monero in, in, in quite some time. Um, yeah, I I I get uh, I I get order I get orders in my publications of Bitcoin and uh, primarily, and that's that's that. So um, I guess uh, the the other the other mm -hmm. area that that you spend uh, a lot of time and uh, and focus on is uh, is the Wasabi Privacy Wallet. Uh, I guess we'll fill, fill us in on uh, on the updates of that, and also again, a brief minute or two overview for for uh, any potential new listeners. Yeah, so Wasabi Wallet is a is a decently old project by now um, that started out with the goal to make privacy the default in a Bitcoin wallet, um, and like that's a big task. Like like I cannot overestimate how huge that work is. And it was obvious that we could not do it all at once, right? So we, we kind of, I, I, I say we have kind of three different phases in the Wasabi Wallet project. Um, the initial phase was called, you know, just the, the research, the proof of concept, the minimum viable product type. This is where Adam Fisk or Napara uh, did a lot of the research on, you know, how can we even do a coin join that is, that is halfway private and efficient. Um, or how can we synchronize the Bitcoin blockchain or like find out how much money we have um, without uh, actually needing to verify every single block since Genesis, right? Um, answer is you kind of have to trust someone else's verification of the full blockchain. But how do you talk to this other full node that you trust um, without ru ruining your privacy, right? So things like this, a lot of more conceptual things that had to be figured out on a fundamental level that work got done with Hidden Wallet. Um, and ultimately that reached a, well, a decent enough state. And this is where Wasabi Wallet was then released as the kind of rebranded, uh, re reprogrammed and refactored version of Hidden Wallet. Um, and that had like so, so good privacy, for example, by default on the network level. By default, uh, just by double clicking the Windows Exe format, uh, like in installation, right? You get Tor packaged under the hood, right? Just running by default with multiple different Tor identities, right? Talking at the same time to different partner, like peers in the Bitcoin network or the CoinJoin coordinator, right? Um, you had this private wallet synchronization with these block filters so that you can get or you can find out how much money you actually have without necessarily telling anyone else how much money you have, uh, which is quite a difficult trick, but it was done by default for everyone, right? Um, and we tried to also improve the privacy as much as we could for transactions, but here we failed to make it the default. Um, so in Wasabi, you, you can uh, do this coin join, which helps you to somewhat obfuscate your transaction history uh, against an outside observer. Like if you get paid from grandma, right, and you do a coin join, and then you sp you spend your money on on some delicious lamp uh, at Pasnia, mm -hmm. then you uh, like your grandma will not find out that you gave money to Shane, right? Um, so uh, th this is what coin join is for. It makes it difficult for other people to follow your transaction history. But the downside in Wasabi was it was not the default, right? 
users had to actively do something in order to actually gain that privacy on the transaction level. Um, and that was not optimal. Um, and it, as a matter of fact, we could not make it the default because it was just inefficient, very expensive, uh, and very cumbersome, actually, quite bad in hindsight. Um, but still, that's that was how Wasabi Wallet 1.0 worked for years now, two, two and a half years or something, um, and still working to this day. Um, but we realized that there are still so many more improvements before we actually get that privacy wallet by default for everyone. Um, and this is where, well, more than a year ago now, we started the Wasabi Wallet Research Club, uh, which was at first meant um, to, hey, let's improve the coin join aspect, because that's kind of the big thing that Wasabi 1.0 did not make perfectly by default. Um, so let's look at all the existing research that was done uh, in on the in the coin join space, and let's pick the best one and just implement it. Right? Sounds easy. Um, well, but after like half a year of of reading papers uh, left and right and talking to authors on a weekly basis, um, by the way, you can listen to most of these research clubs online. They're on YouTube on the Wasabi Wallet channel. Um, okay. But we realized that there are many nice ideas. But none of them is cool. Like none of them is, is perfect um, for what we're looking for. Um, and then we just kind of picked the best conceptual things that we wanted to do, um, like things like no longer standard amounts. Um, like every user should be able to create whatever value output he wants, right? Because currently in Zero Link, the CoinJoin algorithm we use, every user gets exactly 0 0.1 Bitcoin. But what if you don't want 0 0.1 Bitcoin? Well, it sucks for you. You still get it, right? Otherwise, you don't get privacy. So that sucks. We want to improve that. Because that also means there's a minimum denomination. If you have less than 0 0.1 Bitcoin, which, I mean, is quite a lot of money, to be honest, um, is um, like uh, that just prices you out of the market, right? If you don't have 0 0.1 Bitcoin, sorry, no privacy for you. Right? So that was another of the flaws. Um, and that also prevented us from making payments inside a coin join, right? You can only mix to yourself because, well, you only get the standard amount and you don't want to pay 0 0.1 Bitcoin for a pizza, right? You want to send some other amount for that. Um, so a lot of these things we then tried to figure out, and I would say we're almost pretty well successful in actually figuring that out and bringing it all together with a new cryptographic communication protocol that we call Wabi Sabi, uh, which is this ancient philosophy of finding beauty in broken things, mm. right? So you take a pot, you shatter it into pieces, and then you carefully put every piece where it belongs. And for example, you put gold in the cracks, right? Pure gold. It's actually beautiful art. Um, and it was somewhat funny because that's, you know, Bitcoin privacy is broken. Uh, it's, it's quite shattered in pieces, but we can build something beautiful out of this if we just take care to, you know, put every piece where it belongs. Um, so that's what's been our recent work on improving CoinJoin privacy by default for everyone. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, and I, I see your updates. Uh, yeah, you're you're always uh, you're con you're uh, consistently consistently posting um, about uh, Wasabi. I always always good to see uh, to, to again, um, especially with Wasabi, because um, uh, yeah, um, yeah, bit pri privacy is uh, crucially important, and uh, there's 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 still a lot of work to be done in that area, and. Uh, like uh, like I said, that last interview with uh, Smuggler and Frank Braun, I'm, I'm glad there's uh, there's there's uh, there's uh, smart folks working on it. I'm, I'm and uh, yeah, I'm glad. Like I I I I uh, as as much as I would love to, I spent probably I guess uh, in 2019, um, I spent probably you know six months doing uh, you know quite a bit of uh, testing um, in the realm of crypto anarchy, and then la last year happened and. Uh, my focus shifted primarily to the homestead. Um, so yeah, I, I've I've been slacking on 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 uh, I guess uh, the Bitcoin and the the crypto anarchy stuff for sure. Um, I still need to get, um, which yeah, you've, you've you you mentioned uh, to me. I need I need to get uh, I need to start accepting Lightning on Delhi Publication Store um, for digital books, especially which I need to revamp the entire digital library um, in general. But uh, um, and then I need I need to just mm -hmm. get uh, BTC Pay server set up. Um, so that's that's uh, definitely needs to be done for sure. Yeah. Hey, I've I've finally gotten much more involved in BTC Pay. Well, at least under this identity that I can publicly claim that I run a BTC Pay server. Uh, the first time that I do that now, <laughs> um, it's a it's such an amazing tool. Seriously, um, like you know, once it's installed, within you know a minute or two, you can have a public website 
with, of a point of sale system where you have like a catalog of the goods that you offer at a certain price. You can even have like the, the quantity of stock that you have left, right? So it does, it does all that stock management for you. You can have, uh, you know, crowdfunding campaigns, um, you know, similar as Patreon I, I, or uh, these other types. Like I want to collect one Bitcoin. If you, if you donate 0 0.01 Bitcoin, you get a free t-shirt. If you donate 0 0.1, you get a, a full lamp butchered, <laughs> right? <laughs> or whatever it is, the prick that you want. But all of this is just, is just done like in, instantly, like super, super quick. Um, and once you get your Lightning Network wallet set up, which to be honest, as a merchant is still very cumbersome and uh, a bit manual work, um, but it's possible and, you know, then just receiving anonymous Bitcoin payments from anonymous people who you don't know even their name, you don't need to know their email address, nothing, mm -hmm. right? You just, someone tosses you money and you're happy. Uh, it's It's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Um, indeed, and uh, I, I know there's at least a, a couple of folks that, that run stores and such. Could you, I guess, uh, if, if people are interested in getting that uh, that Bitcoin point, point of sale set up, uh, where, uh, how do they do it? Where, where could they go? Yeah, um, you know, a quick preamble, but there is uh, the directory.btcpayserver.org, uh, which shows you a list of publicly identified um, BTC pay servers. It's not an exhaustive list because, well, it's free software. We don't know who runs it in their basement, right? But at least people who claim, like, who, who advertise this publicly. A, a very large list, like hundreds of merchants is there now, um, which is great. Um, so more and more are coming. The way to do this, um, so installing BTC Pay has gotten a lot easier. I mean, if you use the official Docker image, apparently that's like one or two lines of command uh, to, to get that done. Um, I, I personally use the Crypto Anarchy Debian repository, which by the way, um, just the name is beautiful, right? <laughs> but uh, a lovely crypto anarchist called Kiksunil, Martin Nabovciak, wrote this nice piece where um, it's like, so the Debian repository kind of makes sure that all the dependencies are there and that all the requirements are there. So for example, if I type in now in my command line, sudo apt install BTC pay server, it finds out that it needs to install Tor, um, uh, Nginx, like to host the whole website, uh, and the Bitcoin full node, right? Um, and all of this is magically figured out that it's required, downloaded, packaged, and configured just right, right? So that it works out of the box. So you just type in the sudo apt install BTC pay, and it spits you out a onion hidden service where you instantly got your uh, got your BTC pay server configured and your full node is already running and starting to synchronize everything, right? Um, so th this is another great option of actually how to install it. Um, there are there's one other big way, and that is to get these pre-configured computers, um, just basically a Bitcoin box. Uh, the Raspberry Blitz uh, or the Noddle are great ones um, that where we have a, a physical box, you plug that into your router for internet and to power, um, and you get a graphical user interface with just one button, install the Bitcoin software, install the Lightning software, and install BTC Pay. Um, so there are many different ways to install your Bitcoin servers, but there's one important distinction when you want to run a publicly facing BTC Pay server, uh, specifically when you want to do so on the clear net. Right, because your clearnet address is tied to the IP address of wherever you are. And the question is, if you want to reveal to everyone, um, if you have this physical Bitcoin box uh, plugged into your home router, that you live in this area and that you uh, start to be paid in Bitcoin. Right. So again, privacy reasons here. It's not really that advised, at least I think. Um, I mean, there are trade-offs to consider, but in general, probably not the best idea to run a publicly facing um, IP, like ClearNet's uh, Bitcoin service uh, in general at your home. Mm -hmm. um, that's why, for example, I, I, I have this Noddle Bitcoin box um, and I run that only over Tor, right? Because I run it at home. So I don't like, I mm -hmm. don't want to publicly advertise my IP address, right? Um, but then the issue was like for my um, public BTC pay server at towardsliberty.com, uh, I mean, that's publicly facing. And although it is reachable through through the Onion network, it's still reachable through ClearNet. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, I just rented a server in a data center right? Um, and uh, used that to run my Bitcoin full node there. 
um, which again has trade-offs, right? Uh, you know, you have a somewhat trusty server administrator to not, you know, come and steal the hardware and run off, uh, specifically because there are Bitcoin on there, right? And important private keys. Sure. So there is some level of trust involved here compared to you actually owning the hardware in your hand. Um, but it's somewhat of a division of labor and outsourcing, which in this trade-off of a public facing service where uptime is also important, right? Um, and good internet up and downtime, uh, is, is worth to consider. Um, but yeah, uh, by the way, hostforcoins.net, phenomenal cypherpunk uh, uh, hosting service run by Keto Miner, the same guy who does the noddle. Mm -hmm. um, no email or, or only a email address is required. It doesn't even have to be a valid email address. You can write no at mail.com and he will still accept it. As long as you pay in Bitcoin, you get <laughs> access to a server, right? It will be difficult. Like you cannot reset your password if he doesn't have an email, obviously. Um, but he has cool things like PGP encrypted emails, a very privacy focused backend. Like there are no customer names in his database, just random identifiers. Um, and like really sensible cypherpunk, no KYC um, hosting where he accepts uh, Bitcoin over the Lightning Network to get paid, um, which is, is a really nice service that I can recommend. Yes, yes, for sure. I think I actually recommended recommended that one to, to somebody recently. Um, but yeah, I, I saw that pop up and it, yeah, it's, it's awesome to see services like that too. Um, does that, that's going to be, um, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's real, really at this point, it seems like, um, you know, keeping data, not from being wiped away from the face of the earth is kind of, kind of where, kind of, uh, the, the, the main objective. Um, so you got to have people you can trust and you got to have more, you got to have many ways to do these things. And, um, yeah, yeah. Good to see for sure. <laughs> Yeah, actually a question on this, because I know that you're tinkering uh, on uh, the Vanu library or Liberty Under Attack library. Um, how is that thing going with having the decentralized file sharing and, and such? Yeah, so I, I have to say, um, like I, I tried library probably three three years ago or so, and it was yeah as as you're talking about like with most apps, understandably most you know most most open source apps or programs, um, it was it was pretty bad back then. Um, uh, so I, I didn't use it all that often. Um, I got back or I got back into the habit of, of posting on there probably um probably six or seven months ago, and um, it's a really good platform. There's there's the accompanying one Odyssey now. And I find that Odyssey is even a little, um, a little better than than Library is um, in terms of just videos being more reliable. Um, but um, yeah, uh, it's it's easy to upload. Um, very very few problems. Um, no more than on Fascist Tube. Like you know, very you know might have to might have to reupload every once in a while. Um, you know, shit happens. Um, but yeah, I'm 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 pretty pretty surprised. Pretty surprised. Um, and there's actually like I've got more views. I posted. A, a clip, um, a, a video clip from my interview with Frank and Smuggler on like their suggestions for you know an anonymous cell phone in 2021, and that has more has more views on Library than it does on on Fascist Stoop. So um, I think it's actually becoming oh, kind of feasible where these alternative platforms might be, um, you know, might be. Um, yeah, there's there's demand for them. There's demand for them, and and, and like and, and like I said, the the platform's actually pretty pretty stable and it works it works very very well. So um, I'm I'm impressed. I'm I'm definitely impressed. And plus, it's, it, it adds a, it adds yeah, a level of redundancy too. So, um, and, and I guess another benefit benefit about exactly. Odyssey is they pull they uh, they pull your entire YouTube channel. So my entire YouTube channel is is backed up on. Um, so I didn't have to do it, you know, individually one by one. It just automatically backs it up for you. So, um, if you have a channel, um, go ahead, just just do that. It's it's a hundred percent worth it. They back up everything for you. Um, so yeah. Oh, that is super interesting um, because it actually, this is something that I was looking into recently because I started a new, a new podcast where after such a long time, I have to look at, at the YouTube studio interface and oh my, is it horrible? Right. <laughs> like it's such a shitty UX, such an unproductive tool, incredible. Um, but well, right, YouTube is the platform to be, but I like we already decentralized um, the by the way, it's uh, the Join the Wasabikas Bitcoin Privacy Podcast. Uh, so probably your audience w will like that mm -hmm. one too. So we we also published that uh, on a podcast RSS feed, right? Which is already one type of of uh, like redundancy. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. But of course, more especially if automated, and especially if in a um, censorship resistant decentralized file hosting network. Um, yeah, that's that's very interesting, and it's great to see that there's actually demand, uh, you know, specifically in our niche. Uh, I think that's mm -hmm. a very smart choice. So thanks for the tip. I will follow up on that. 
Yeah, yeah, no problem. And and the other thing, uh, and this is another improvement from a few years back, but um, there's the library app, which if you if you're uploading a video that's more than like two gigabytes, you have to use the app, um, the the installed app. Otherwise, you can go. Um, it's it's still like all channels, all videos, everything's viewable from um, like a web, like a just a web address. Um, so that's that's pretty handy too. Um, I would say because you can share those around on. Um, you can actually share those around on on you know on social media, um, whereas if it was an app, like they'd have to have the app installed before they could view it. So um, there's yeah there's there yeah lots 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 of improvements and uh, it's it's a no brainer. Um, it's it's definitely a no brainer. I've been focusing really really heavily. Um, I guess the past six months or so, just yeah redundancy with everything. Like it's 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 kind of ridiculous at this point. Like how many places I have everything backed up in. Um, but hey, like it's it's not it's not hard to do. Data storage is cheap. And you might as well go crazy with it, right? Um, that's that's kind of uh, where I, where I've been, and and plus I get to try out all these new platforms too. Um, so, yeah, and, yeah. And, and and at some point, yeah, at, and at some point, that, the, that at I some point, say. the payoff on library might be might actually be um, be good too, because they, they do have their own they they do have their own crypto coin, and uh, you do get um, like you get tips for people who watch the video, and people can send you tips and such too. So um, that's another another cool feature for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, Smuggler brought me on uh, on that idea of just going absolutely crazy with backups. Um, like, uh, it's it's just smart to have encrypted USB sticks, like with a strong password encryption, like they're unbreakable, right? Um, so you can put them anywhere, right? So why not put them, you know, somewhere in a subverse, subway station underneath like some tile or in like a, a public utility box that has some electric fuses <laughs> or just hide them like in any bush or, or anywhere. Um, I mean, why not? If someone finds them, well, doesn't matter, right? Yeah. It's encrypted. Uh, they will not get anything out of it, but it, it protects you from your house burning down and you losing all your, um, all your, all your important data, mm -hmm. right? Especially when, when it's about, you know, encryption keys and, and Bitcoin keys, you want to have many backups. So go crazy with it, right? Dig holes in the forest, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and probably while you're at it, it's a good place to also do food storage, right? So yep. do some canned meat and your Bitcoin private keys and yep. dig a hole in the forest. <laughs> Bingo, bingo. Yep, yep. And 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 uh, you know, digitally speaking too. One, once you get the system set up now, um, it's it's just maintenance after that point. Um, for example, there's these uh, these RAID storage systems where um, they're they're two drive. Um, you know, they're two drive, basically cloud storage systems. And you basically save you save it on one on one hard drive, and it du duplicates it to the other one. And then you could have it automatically set up to where it syncs, you know, off site to like two or three different places. Then you could access it remotely from any of the like. It, it's just crazy what you can do nowadays, and it doesn't cost a but like a couple hundred dollars to set up like it's crazy what you can do um so again as i've said so many times to you guys just like you know the the only the only limit is your imagination so yeah go go have fun with this stuff um <laughs> indeed yeah yeah for sure and uh you know here again keto miner actually is, is is quite a couple nice projects out there because with the the newer version of the noddle it comes with this raid setup with two discs right so you have two discs uh both encrypted and they keep your, you know, your lightning or all your Bitcoin stuff secure and redundant, um, because it might actually happen that sometimes your, you know, your disk crashes or some weird things. Oh yeah. Uh, and then at least you have a backup, right? So very smart. And he offers the same thing actually for host for coins. So for this, um, uh, like virtual private servers, um, like the services that I run are redundant. I think four or five hard drives. Like ridiculous, I have no idea how it works, uh, but you know, that's why you hire entrepreneurs yep. to solve the problem for you. <laughs> Yep, for sure, for sure, and 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 again, like you, you, there's so much, there's so much you can do with those things. Like essentially, um, uh, well, essentially, it's just a box with hard drives, so you can do whatever you want with it, right? Um, but like, uh, there's there's um, not the one that I use, but there's other variations where um, you could have, you could get it set up, um, you could have it set up for yeah, a lot of things. Um, I, I, I I've, I've talked about the Pasnia library a number of times. Um, you could do like a Pasnia library on one of these things. We're gonna build one ourselves, our damn selves. We're not gonna trust another company, but um, you. You could do it on on one of these things but um yeah yeah um yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. actually what I, what I wanted to ask about specifically like what what information are you planning to put on the pasnia library yeah so um essentially um want to have um obviously just uh um directories uh you know guides information on yep yeah, um really just 
information on anything people might find useful. Um, cause again, data storage is cheap nowadays. Um, whether it's a, a guide on, um, permaculture farming or, um, you know, a, a book on ancient Gnosticism, like it doesn't matter. Like we'll put it, we'll put it in the library. We'll, you know, have, have different sections for PDFs for audiobooks. Um, maybe, pe maybe some people want to contribute. Um, uh, maybe we can have, you know, our, our own little open source, our own little decentralized, uh, you know, versions of Spotify and Netflix on the Pasnia library. You gotta be a stakeholder though to, uh, um, to, to become a part of that. Um, kidding a little bit, but, um, yeah, really that's, that's kind of the idea, um, is just, um, yeah, that the the digital the digital file storage is backing up backing up and and making it backing up on IPFS and, and and various other open source decentralized platforms, um, and then um, also doing at at some point it'd be pretty cool. Um, the idea with Pasnia, so like Pasnia is the overall like the 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 idea is that pa, pa, or, so that Pasnia is the country, and uh, like here where I am, it's Veritas Pasnia. Pasnia should like I I, I envision I hope Pasnia is all over the place, and I'm hoping we can have physical Pasnia libraries too. So, um, actual, you know, physical backing up of all of these things as well. So I don't know. It's, it's an idea I'm kind of tossing around yeah. and working with. Um, and it's still, I mean, it's, it's still, it's still just an idea in my head. Uh, our buddy Jamie Baconic is, uh, he's, he's working on, uh, he's working on that. And, uh, I should have my, my prototype of it here soon. And, uh, then we'll be, um, I guess opening it up to, uh, you know, a dozen or so people to, uh, I guess begin some testing and things. So, um, yeah, not very clear. Yeah. I know, but we're still putting it together. It's still a work in progress as so many other things are. Yeah. You know, this is a lovely concept and I, I appreciate it a bunch because it's, you know, keeping this highly curated form of information accessible, even if the internet goes offline, right, is is vital. It's, it's so important um, for, for all types, right? Uh, just, you know, growing your own food, like building a farm, all these informations, if shit hits the fan, if the internet goes down, you will want to have all that knowledge. Um, so having redundant mm -hmm. backups of that makes absolute sense. Um, I, I, actually, uh, there is uh, one, a similar project um, by Mark Passio, an uh, incredibly good teacher on, on natural law, philosophy, and uh, many, many other things. Very much recommended. Especially mm -hmm. his nine-hour lecture on natural law is probably the most important video I've ever watched. Um, it, like, it's in, incredibly good, and I've seen it like 10 yeah. times. Um, but he has uh, the so-called ARC. Uh, the Archive of Occult Research and Knowledge or something is the acronym for. Um, but it's a one terabyte hard drive filled with PDFs. I, hey, filling in a terabyte with PDFs is ridiculous. Yeah, it's hard to do. <laughs> but he also <laughs> has, has videos in there. Yeah, but it's like, it's like a lifetime's work of research condensed down and curated down into one. Ter I'm looking at it right now. It's just like this one disk lying on the table. But it has a fountain of knowledge of so many generations. Um, so to have more of these arcs out there uh, with different types of curation um, is, uh, and different, you know, focuses is, is super important. So it's it's great work that you're doing there. And I for sure want to get my hands of one of those. <laughs> awesome. Well, well thanks. Uh, yeah, it's, um, yeah, I don't know. Cause it's just, just another, another thing we're working on. Um, and yeah, there's, there's obviously other benefits too. um, you know, a box like that, um, it's going to have the, um, oh, what's it? Yeah. I guess it's the, the freedom box. Um, the, I guess the freedom box, it, there's a lot, you can pretty much add any plugin plugin. It's just basically a one click install of, of, uh, anything you want, decentralized chat. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, like I, I, I envision too, um, there's a big move happening towards, uh, um, getting, uh, websites, uh, on, I guess, uh, uh, IPFS, um, getting actual websites, um, off of, um, you know, centralized, uh, you know, I guess, um, posting providers. Um, so, um, we, we can, we can do all that stuff from the, from the freedom box. So like there's, I mean, and hell it could even, you know, add Bitcoin wallets. I mean, anything that we like make like a really, really slick, you know, um, because we, 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 we it, as you're finding out with with uh, wasabi and other things if you want something done you kind of have to do it yourself a lot of times right um and and we've got such we've got such very specific needs and desires that we do have to kind of do that so um <laughs> so yeah it's, it's 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 still still all coming together it was supposed to be uh, it was supposed to be done um but um yeah it's uh there's there's always always unexpected things and, and plus in the in the realm of uh the technology um i outsource that stuff to jam and i've got enough to specialize in um, but, uh, um, yeah, I, I let him deal with that stuff for me. Um, but, uh, yeah, so definitely working on it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well for one, right, cypherpunks write code. 
of stop stop complaining but build the tools <laughs> that you need to defend your liberties yeah. right that's that's the ethos of cypherpunk uh so great that you're doing that but <laughs> lovely that you say that your timeline got completely busted um because well that's free software for you yep. so much for roadmaps in the space they yep. don't work out <laughs> <laughs> oh it's but it's horrible man i i wanted to launch a project january this year like right after new year's um working hard with Kixunil uh, to get that done but oh it was just so many hurdles so many unexpected things uh and now three months later four months almost four months later uh well now i'm actually at a state where i i can start to announce it but it, it's still not even fully done like it's not yet deployed on on the production ready server um it's just in a testing environment now but at least we got it ready for testing right after such a delay mm -hmm. but well if you want to do it right right be patient and it will be rewarded yeah yep indeed indeed so um i, I mean you mentioned uh, and I, I took a look at it myself um you mentioned that you got uh um you've got bt space server set up on on your website uh and you've got um I guess uh, you offer, I guess Bitcoin, uh, some 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 really really uh, valuable Bitcoin stuff. So you want to tell, tell the listeners a little little bit about that uh, and what you're what you're offering there? Yeah. So so this server again is, is based on the Crypto Anarchy Debian repository, and that's what made it incredibly easy to install BTC Pay Server. Like one command, and it just worked magically, and has has never had a downtime ever since. Um, and I, I teamed up with uh, like. Um, uh, or the the other thing that that we are working so hard to get in is uh, Nextcloud, and on Nextcloud is this is this collaboration platform, um, and um, it it allows you to you know write, uh, share files and work together at the same time on the same file like kind of Google Docs does, right? Um, you know has has the calendar with um, like appointment scheduling, uh, like a a, a a chat application, a video call application, like all of these things coming together in one application on your own server, um, all free and open source, right? So it's it's a quite a, a nice project. Um, and this is what's now finally out there and that I finally want to start using, um, mm -hmm. uh, specifically with Bitcoin integration, right? This is the new thing that we're actually building here. And that is basically to sell access rights to files and functions on this next cloud server, right? So very interesting for you too, right? Um, this is basically if you want to sell an audiobook, right? Or a PDF or, or um, anything, basically, you can just have that file uploaded on Nextcloud and the user can purchase the like the, 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 the rights for his account to actually view this file or mm -hmm. potentially even to edit this file, right? Um, and all of this implemented with these very private payments over the Bitcoin Lightning Network um, and automatically. Um, so that's somewhat of the tech stack that we're building here is this collaboration platform that has Bitcoin payments natively integrated. Um, and I think that's just a very, very, very powerful idea that can be used in so many different use cases, right? Um, but the way that I want to use it specifically is to, to get, to build a tribe uh, of of people who really understand the principles of, of freedom in general. Um, and that's difficult to understand, right? Um, I mean, even if you if you start glimpsing, you know, the, the values of freedom, if you're already at that point, you just enter the rabbit hole, right? And mm -hmm. it, it goes deep. I mean, you know, you, you can confirm that. It's like you, yeah. you can go in any any niche and focus hours of your time in mastering that subject. And it's an incredibly fulfilling work, right? But mm -hmm. well, it takes time and it's difficult. Um, and for me personally, what I've discovered that the best or what, not of, saying the best is always a bit of an overstatement, but one of the best ways to, to discover truth um, is through the Socratic method, um, which is this, well, methodological approach to have a good conversation. Hmm. Um, and it's very meaningful to look in. Um, of course, it was used by Socrates fam famously to teach philosophy and, and um, you know, thinking about problems. Um, but it's, it's general, this, this approach of improving your critical thinking skills. So, you know, it, it starts with asking questions, right? Um, what, like, what do we actually want to solve? What is the problem? right like defining that at first like what is the question that we want to think about right 
Um, and that, that part being that it's not just one person asking all the questions, but that everyone asks the questions um, and every participant in the conversation is uh, is getting a chance to well, speak up and to be part, right? And uh, to actually create that knowledge of coming up what the good question is, because it's really difficult. I mean, you know it as a podcast host, right? But asking mm -hmm. questions is tricky. And very often, it's going to be a stupid question too, right? So the, the second aspect of the Socratic method is to question the question, right? <laughs> so, okay, this is the problem that we put in the room. Is it actually an important problem? Like, is it worth even talking about the yeah. subject? Or is the question like, will the sky turn yellow tomorrow? Well, I don't know. Like, is it meaningful to talk about that? Well, probably, like in some context, yes, but not in if you want to discover more about freedoms, right? Um, so questioning the question, uh, always important in critical thinking. Like, because again, if, if your question is, is, is stupid, you're going to get a stupid answer, right? Um, so if you want to find a meaningful answer, well, ask the meaningful question, mm -hmm. right? And here again is, is somewhat of the difficulty because if you have not yet fallen down the rabbit hole, you might not even know the right questions to ask. Right? You might not know you're um, supposed to ask questions. And this you, is, you know, you're, you're told not to ask questions, actually. To be, yeah, to be frank, yeah, you're told not to ask questions. <laughs> exactly, right? That's that's actually even where it starts, right? If, if you're still in the status mindset, you're not yeah. even going to think about asking her questions because, well, that's what the authorities do, right? I'm just here to answer questions. <laughs> and I for sure should not question the question of the authority, right? If the teacher asks the, the question, it's a perfect question and we all have to think about it now, right? Um, so that that part is absolute bullshit, right? And the Socratic method makes that obvious. Mm -hmm. um, and when when I host these Socratic seminars, like so often people say, "Max, that was just a stupid question." Like I don't get it, um, and that that gives me such meaningful feedback um, that where I have a flaw in my mind, right? I like I I I want to reach a certain conclusion um, uh, or like find out something, right? But the question that I ask is completely off and will not will not get me there, right? So for me, having that feedback directly is is so important, um, just to hone down on my own thinking, right? Yeah, yeah, you're you're exactly right. You're exactly right. And I, I guess um, I've said in in uh, maybe a past podcast and, and and an article, kind of kind of along those along those same lines, is. Um, <clears throat> is yeah it's it's again just questioning like that's that's the most important thing is you know questioning how you how questioning um how you got how you got to this information how you how you how you discovered it um and, and then yeah as you were saying is it worth my time is it worth my effort um is it is it going to does it going to make me you know better as a person is, or is it going to increase my personal freedom is it gonna make me more mental mentally spiritually or or physically free is it gonna do any of those things well if it's not then um then at best it's a hobby or entertainment right um and it's really really important to know to know what those things are and, and, and kind of be able to, to, to draw that line um because yeah as you said you can you can you can definitely i mean there's you can spend entire lifetimes on pretty much any of these subjects and there are thousands of them if not more than that um but just, just to give you an idea to, to, to yeah, which which most folks here would know but uh but yeah you're exactly right mm -hmm. yeah yeah right so it it starts here but um it, it goes further because then you know once you put the question out there you actually have to think right if you want to answer the question that's where your thinking process starts right and this is this is somewhat of the the trouble that i have with the current content consume like consumer culture like everyone is on youtube everyone is on netflix everyone is consuming information right and that's that's super important like you do need to consume information, otherwise you will not continue any mm -hmm. further, right? There needs to be input uh, into the into the computer, right? Your um, like your your uh, rhetoric has to be there. Um, but then the next part is to th is to think, right? And yeah. you're only going to think if you want to make an answer, right? If you um, and w when you only watch something, you don't have the opportunity to give an answer, so you don't really think mm -hmm. um, and that's that's what the socratic method is is makes it so interesting it's it's not a, a frontal like in your face offloading of information it's asking a question and then you have to answer it right so this forces you like it puts you in an uncomfortable situation because there's a difficult question 
and you don't know the answer to it, right? But you still have to answer, well, something, right? And this is an uncomfortable situation that your brain does not like, right? Having an unsolved problem. Mm -hmm. So you actually start solving it, right? And you start thinking on, on how to solve the problem and how to fix your situation and how to get out of that uncomfortable silence, right? Um, so this is why I felt why I value this interactive format so much as a like as a student who seeks to learn more, is because it it forces me to actually think, right, and and to be active in the conversation and to create the content rather than just to consume it. Right, right, yeah, I'm I'm definitely with you. I'm definitely with you, and it, it reminds me. And I guess the the um, I'm sure you're familiar with the trivium method of, of critical thinking. Um, the trivium, I guess, could go before or after that. Once you once you figure out the question, um, then you could go into the trivium and start with your and and, and start with, um, you know, actually, you know, working towards that answer. Um, but uh, yeah, I I love it, man. Um, I I definitely do. Um, and, uh, so, so I guess, um, if people go to, toward, uh, to, to your website, towardsliberty.com, um, uh, I guess, yeah, how, how can they, how can they, uh, you know, get, get involved with, the, with, with, with one of these sorts of things? When's the next one, uh, et cetera? Yeah. So, uh, there are a couple different, um, like topics to talk about, uh, and, you know, each of them is, is a huge rabbit hole that you can dive in again for hours, right. Mm -hmm. For, for years. Right. Um, so uh but one of the important ones is uh, of course you know bitcoin uh bitcoin is such a important question uh that has to be answered right for for everyone i mean i'm telling you if if you did not ask yourself the question of why does bitcoin exist and why do people like it like you're missing out so much you're losing hard like you're you're being stolen from on a massive scale of like there's no way that you can win in your current situation uh good luck but your your boat is crashing hard like you're on the train wreck uh get the fuck out right mm -hmm. so answering that question of course is is very very valuable um but you know bitcoin is nice and all but it's not everything um it really isn't um so there, like, what what goes personally for me as well is is entrepreneurship. Like, this is something that I love the the entrepreneurial archetype that that individual who has a creative spark in his mind and the fire in the heart to act upon that creativity and to actually solve problems, not just for himself but for others too. Right? It's it's such a beautiful thing, and I value it so much because it it helps me to to be a better you know, human in this world, right? And to actually be productive and to fix things, right? So understanding praxeology, the, the science of human action and, you know, economics in general, um, with that entrepreneurial thinking is, is a very, is a, again, a very important question for me to, to ask, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah it, like one of the things that that you will like very much uh, is is the category of liberation strategies, right? Um, because I mean, you know, obviously, right? Uh, this is somewhat the overarching thing, right? Bitcoin is about liberation. For me, entrepreneurship is about liberation. Like a free man is an entrepreneur. Um, so, but here we go specifically into things like crypto anarchy, right? Vanu. Uh, this is actually one of the main talking points here because it's such a beautiful liberation strategy. Um, of course, the second realm, nomadism, security culture, like mm -hmm. all of these topics basically that you're consuming here right now in this podcast is being created in, in these Socratic seminars here. Um, and like finishing that up with, with a, a standalone chapter on operational security, right? So all about privacy. Um, why is privacy important? Like answering that question has such deep insights uh, that is, is yeah it's just again worth thinking about and like secure computing right i'm like i'm right now talking to you it's routed like all the communication through hunix in my cube setup in a dedicated disposable virtual machine because i don't trust chromium and jitsi right <laughs> so um like there's a lot of things that i've learned as a non-developer coming back just from economics right on how I can improve my liberties in the cyberspace, uh, like drastically and become unfuckwithable, basically. Like, uh, you can have a really, really solid setup that no government agency, uh, <laughs> can break. Um, uh, well, to a certain extent, of course. Right. Um, but at least you can step up your game. Um, and it's, it's very important again, to answer this question of 
is my operational security good enough? Right? Is that even a good question to ask? Or is my point of view already uh, flawed? Right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, lots of in interesting things to talk about. And again, uh, all of them done in the Socratic method, which I just think is, is uh, quite valuable to be in. Awesome. Awesome. Well, um, yeah, I def I'll definitely want to add some uh, information for, uh, for, for those uh, in the show notes. I'm sure there's plenty of, uh, plenty of uh, folks in my audience who'd be interested in, uh, in checking those things out. And uh, yeah, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, I'm with you on the, uh, especially, especially as of the past year and a half, but because um, uh, I guess I've gotten to, gotten to witness it firsthand more. Um, I guess for for a longer a longer period, but um, really the the first step to liberation is it's it's that it's that financial aspect. Um, it really is, um, you know, having whether it's uh, you know, uh, yeah, it's well, whether it's uh, you know becoming financially independent and retiring early and not having to work at all, or if uh, or if it's uh, like what we do, Max, where I'm sure you, this isn't work to you. This is like um, this is this is incredibly incredibly enjoyable. It's um, yeah, it's, 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 you know, it's not work. So, um, like it, you get to that point where you can start to, uh, where you can start to live off of, um, I guess, uh, I guess live off of what you, you know, what you, I guess what, what you enjoy doing. And then also, um, I guess, uh, being able to, um, as you talk about, uh, solve problems and, uh, we're certainly trying to solve some, some big problems with, uh, with the second realm with Bitcoin and things like that. But, um, it's, uh, really is crazy. Um, I guess, uh, just the, as I've said so many times in the past, so many times, but yeah, over the past year and a half or so. Um, so, uh, yeah, great, great to hear, uh, hear about what you're doing over there. Um, I guess, uh, another, another question, which kind of, kind of overlaps here. And it was, it was the reason I will say it was the reason why I went and looked, uh, I think it was yesterday. Um, one of the reasons I went, I went and visited your website yesterday was I remember you had uh, resources on there and I, I, it was something I recall from maybe like six months or a year ago, but, uh, you had references or links to, um, Gnostic material. Was that, was that correct? Or am I misremembering that? Yes. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. Towards Liberty was for a long time a, a archive of knowledge about well liberation strategies uh, with a, a big focus on natural law. Mm -hmm. um, because, well, I created that at a time where I was falling down the natural law rabbit hole, mainly thanks to Mark Passio, mm -hmm. uh, who I've met just before I created the website. Um, uh, like, it, it was a, uh, so that was very much a focus. And I, I, I hate that it's currently down. Um, but it is because it's a work in progress. <laughs> and again, I thought the work in progress would be done three months ago, right? That's why I took it down. But thanks to the reliability of the roadmap in free software development, <laughs> no chance. Uh, so, um, but this will come back uh, again with the power of Nextcloud and much, much, much better. Like with, uh, like uh, again, an actual folder structure and a folder, like folder archive. Uh, of, of public information, searchable in an index. Like, I mean, Nextlord is made for file sharing, right? So I'm just going to use that as a public file sharing service <laughs> for all of the things that I like to talk about. Um, and again, this is this is very much tied to the Socratic seminars, right? Because like these seminars are not just the only place where you're going to learn something new. No, like you're going to read and you're going to listen like a lot. You're going to consume content. Yes, right? The first step of the trivia, um, like to take in knowledge, um, vitally important, right? And again, having a curated um, archive for this is 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 incredible. Like I'm, plan I'm actually now thinking about just hooking up my ARC hard drive on a Raspberry Pi as an external um, hard drive to my next cloud storage. Um, and then, you know, make that publicly accessible and well, everyone can, uh, then read the arc, um, mm -hmm. who has access like in that server. Um, I mean, why not, why not, why not add your, your Pasnia library as well? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, like, uh, the, the, the more we can, we can curate and, uh, and make that information available to the right people, it, but, uh, but again, again, like with the difficulty of not overloading, right, and not not giving too much information in your face, but actually, you know, building these Socratic seminars around this information um, and kind of guiding you down that rabbit hole, helping to find out the right resources to look up and the right questions to ask, right, um, is it kind of goes, comes in together nicely. Uh, so I'm, yeah. I, I, I think it's 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 a good approach and a nice idea. Yeah, yeah, and uh, um, uh, yeah, I was just curious. Like, uh, and, and the reason I, the reason I asked was, um, I mean, it's it's something that's 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 been another another discovery of mine. I mean, uh, did that ancient second realm episode? I think it was um, 
was it uh, nine, 90 something of the pod 93 94 of the podcast but so uh, we did an episode on ancient second realms and like a lot of the like a lot of these secret societies are saying the exact same shit that we're saying is anarchists like it's the exact same shit um obviously in a good way but it's the exact same stuff and like um if someone were to come at like so like i got to you know i guess natural law and it sounds like you did too through like through anarchy right it was very much you know through anarchy through through um, you know free market economics um well like you could have a whole group like uh, there's obviously that other that other angle too where people could just come at this from like a, a purely like christian or spiritual angle too and arrive at the exact same place um and for for different reasons so like that was just a really interesting um, an interesting find for me because I, I was always told to be afraid of these, you know, secret societies and things. But they're saying the th- same the same things that we are. So maybe I maybe I'm starting to understand why they're trying to scare us away from looking at these things. Um, I don't know. So just some, something I've been thinking about. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, think about the word occult. If you ask a random person on the street, like, what do you feel when I say the word occult? Everyone's like, oh, like scary, dangerous. The word uh, cult like is in there. That's, like, that's why it scares people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. It has a very scary connotation. But what does it actually mean? It comes from the Greek occultare, to hide, to conceal, right, to keep hidden. Um, so, and that's basically what hidden societies are, right? It's it's occult knowledge. Uh, and and why is it occult? Because, uh, well, if you if you want to control people, right. You don't want them to have the information of you're you're not controllable. You are a sovereign individual. You are unfuckwithable, right? You don't want to tell slaves that they are free men in heart and in spirit, right? Uh, obviously. So what do you do? You occult that knowledge. You hide that knowledge. You make it look scary and dangerous and discourage everyone from looking in. And that is a trend in human society since, well, forever because people want to control other people. And the great way to do that is, is to control the mind by removing important information. Um, if there's no information, you will not think about it, right? If there's no input, nothing can come out, right? Um, so as, as long as these informations are kept, um, like occulted, are kept hidden, are kept obscure at the fringes, um, so will will be the the success of individuals searching for these. Um, so Bitcoin is occult knowledge. Vanu is occult knowledge. Um, like Second mm-hmm. Realm is occult knowledge. The masters do not want you to read this, not at all. They would love to stop you having access to this type of information. That's exactly how you know that it's valuable information, right? The shit that they don't mm-hmm. want you to know. <laughs> so absolutely, look into the occult. Look into the shadows, look into what's hidden and what's creeping in the darkness, shine a light and see where the cockroaches go, right? Um, because the conclusions with, with that type of mindset are, well, very, very vast and, and far reaching. Yes. Yes, for sure, for sure, and and, and well said. I'm I'm glad we we uh, we went there a little bit in this in this podcast because I've been looking into it and I've been dropping I've been dropping some stuff in, in podcasts throughout. But um, I I wanted to I, like I wanted to make it very clear why like. Um, why this is relevant because I, I I did like this was where I started I started with I guess you could say like Bill Cooper and Mystery Babylon like this is where my past started before anarchy um, and like I guess at, at that point I didn't really realize that I, I guess I obviously didn't realize where, where it was going to end up but um, but yeah that's why this is important is that like you look back at like that that 1904 Ross Crucian text that we looked at on this podcast for the Ancient Second Realms episode and yeah it's the exact same stuff that we're talking about you know non-aggression and um, you know building building second realms you know away from societies that will not respect natural law like it's the exact same stuff it's crazy um it's just a cra- crazy in a good way so um i guess um yeah we've been going for for yeah, hour, hour and 15 I, I guess a- any other thoughts on um on, on that yeah um check your check your assumptions um like question the question right make sure mm-hmm. that you're thinking in the right framework that's so important like if you're if your assumption is that you know the, the, the collective exists and and the, uh, everyone acts for the best interest of the collective right if if these types of, of weird uh, mysticism are your assumption then you're gonna reach weird conclusions right if you don't even know what your assumptions are then you're completely lost right so make sure you have solid assumptions and mm-hmm. and really question them and think of how to break them um that will help a lot with um well making sure that uh, you will 
reach ultimate conclusions that are meaningful, right? That you uh, find some meaningful answers to meaningful questions. Um, uh, but I've, I guess I'm preaching to the choir here, right? Because everyone listening listening to the Vano podcast, uh, I, I, I think, um, shows by action, right? By, by actually listening uh, and accumulating this knowledge, um, show that there is some creative and cur curious spark uh, within them. And that's something that's that really gives me a lot of hope. Um, that at least in our bubble, right, it seems that there are many conscious individuals who who care uh, mm -hmm. and and who will um, who will apply themselves to be productive, um, who who will strive to be entrepreneurs, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that is that is a beautiful sign, and um, that that is really what keeps me going. Um, much more than just Bitcoin, because Bitcoin is only a tool, right? Same as as the internet, same mm -hmm. same as your computer, uh, same as a calculator, same as your car, right? Just a tool. Without you, it's nothing. Uh, it's it, it's all about how you utilize this tool and what you make with it, what you create by by employing your own time and your ingenuity and and that that human fire to actually build something delightful. Uh, so again, um, the individual is my starting point. It's my assumption, uh, and uh, like out of that, I. I draw immense hope for the future, where uh, despite uh, so much government tyranny uh, in in this last year, um, more than ever, I, I see uh, individuals um, starting to act and uh, like resisting, uh, which which is uh, which is a beautiful thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm uh, definitely, definitely right there with you. And uh, I appreciate you coming back on. Always, uh, always a great discussion. Um, lots of, uh, yeah, lots of overlapping, uh, overlapping areas of uh, discussion for sure. Um, I guess uh, before I let you go, uh, I guess uh, you want to plug away one more. It's TowardsLiberty.com. Uh, anywhere else you'd uh, like to point the listeners in the direction of? One one more thing, actually, mm -hmm. that sure. I that I want to emphasize with Towards Liberty as, as you bring it up. Um, it's It's... It's a project built on pure free software, N not just with the technology used, but with the ethos and the building process. Um, and that is something that is is very important to me, is, is you know, especially financing um, free software projects, right? Um, so it, in in the process of just building this, there were were countless, um, well, some of the nations or encouragements for free software developers to continue doing the awesome shit that they do, uh, and I want to keep that focus on on fostering a healthy. Uh, second realm community that builds free, strong, powerful free software. So I, I offer a 50% discount for any serious contributor to free software. Um, um, so 50% discount on all uh, the, the seminars uh, and the individual sessions. Um, the, and, uh, you know, that goes for people who write the code, people who write the documentation and fix typos, or people that financially sponsor free software projects. But but if you are seriously involved in, in creating something beautiful uh, in, in the realm of cyberspace, uh, then reach out before you go to the shop and I will get you a discount code um, af after actually seeing that, that you do some meaningful work. Um, and further than that, of course, right? All all the revenue will come that comes in will, of course, be used to advance uh, free software uh, and uh, the awesome shit that we can build. Uh, so uh, this is, you know, one my part of of building that circular economy uh, in in a solid second realm. Yep, yep. It's got yep got it's got a, yep. That's uh, <clears throat> yeah. But putting that up that money that effort back into um, yeah, as we've been saying, the second realm. Um, yep, yep. Love it. Um, very good, man. Well, I appreciate you coming back on. Um, we'll we'll have to get you back on uh, uh, in the future, of course. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, one more chance. Anything else before I let you go? <laughs> oh, uh, not not much else uh, other than Shane. Thank you for all the work you do. Uh, like the Vanu podcast, really is, is stellar work, and you know, Liberty Under Attack uh, Publications is uh, such a stellar resource. Just recently, I was on the website and was like, wow, there's. There's so much good good knowledge there. I gotta read Bushfire seriously. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm craving for some good anarchist fiction, um, so this is uh, definitely on my reading list. Right um, on. So yeah, keep it up, man. Uh, you're doing you're doing good work. 
Hey, appreciate that. Appreciate that. You, you too. Uh, uh, you too, of course, man. You too. Uh, you too, of course. Um, so yeah, guys. Um, that's uh, there. You have it. Max Hillebrand uh, towards Liberty dot com, and uh, check the show notes for every uh, for all the uh, all the other uh, links uh, and uh, everything else. Um, I guess I will mention just real quickly that uh, I did update the Vani bundle as of um, that was yeah this morning actually. Uh, and uh, yeah, as of uh, this morning, I'll put it on screen for the uh, for the folks over at uh, Library or Odyssey, or if you're still on Fascist Tube. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, we're on other platforms. Um, but yeah, uh, know, I saw yeah, go ahead. that update on the Telegram Pasnia group. Uh, so guys, don't forget to to uh, go to the Telegram Pasnia group for high quality <laughs> uh, and notifications. <laughs> yes, yes, um, yes, Pasnia too, um, Pasnia as well. Um, yeah, and uh, I do have uh, I updated on the on the Vani podcast website. Um, I updated uh, the links to the uh, the various Pasnia Telegram channels. So yeah, definitely get in there. Um, it's a uh, you know real yeah real real second real real people. Um, and uh, yeah, I know uh, personally know like every single person in there. So um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Um, but uh, um, but yes, uh, the um, like I was saying, uh, Vani Bundle uh, just updated it as of uh, it's been a couple of years. We got got new books, um, so check that out if uh, if you're interested um, in uh, anything you hear uh, in this podcast. Uh, lots of uh, certainly lots of great material. And uh, the only other um, announcement uh, for right now is that uh, come out on the podcast feed too. But um, for right now, the Vani Beginners Guide is up on the Agoras Nexus website. I uh, just uh, wanted to uh, put it out there first. I'll let you guys know. I, I always appreciate. Um, uh, I'm uh, the editor over at Agoras Nexus, and I, they put out a lot of really, really great content. So I um, wanted to, to let you guys know about uh, my newest article there and uh, agorasnexus.com, generally speaking. Um, so I guess uh, that pretty much uh, wraps up today's episode. Hope you enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, always remember, Vani was yours for the making. Till next time, guys. Thanks. Our strategy for liberty is the creation of a culture of liberty, a society that occupies its own protected space and implements independent systems of cooperation. We need to create a second realm. Device connection.